I just wanted to go over some of what you can expect for uh, maintaining the lease, what kind of activities you can and can't do on the lease and things like that. So Portia mentioned the Coast Guard markers. Um, hopefully you can see this sign here. Um, so the, the whole AUZ is going to be bordered by uh, these larger 3x3 three three signs. It looks a lot like a navigation channel sign, but it, it would be yellow. Not all the leases are going to have those on them, but if you do happen to get a lease that has one of these, you would be required to maintain it. And uh, so it's a three by three foot yellow sign uh, on a, it has to be a minimum of a six inch pole and you can see a little marine lantern there on the top. And then it'll also have the corner direction and your lease number. You, it's hard to tell, but it's in a sign right there. So it's, I would say probably only about 30% of the leases will probably end up having one of these on there. The other type of marker though is gonna be required for all the leases is what we call a parcel post. And you can see here, it's, it's basically a two inch PVC pipe that's got the corner direction on it and also has your lease no, or parcel number on it. So you can see in this one up here, that's, gonna, that's the southwest corner of lease uh, eight, L819. So this is a way that it designates your area. It's basically so you can keep track of where you're at in, in the larger AZ. So as part of being a, uh, having one of these leases, you will be required to maintain these poles. So here's kind of just a general layout to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So you can see like the, these Coast Guard yellow signs, they're, they're only gonna be on the outside of the whole large area, but those PVC posts are gonna have to be on all four corners. And it allows you to really see the easements well when they're all marked clearly. So just a little bit about public use, because I know that's a big question. What, what can people do and not do on the leases? Uh, the general public is allowed to, to be on all, these, all the leases. They can swim and fish and those kind of things. Uh, most folks are, you know, they're going to traverse through the easements or the boundaries, but they can't be stopped. So you can, they are allowed to fish and uh, place crab traps and things like that. They just can't interfere with your gear. And so that's, that's a really key point. The other thing that they're not allowed to do is wild harvest of shellfish within the lease boundaries. They have to be at least 25 feet outside of a lease. So no one can be doing that. But it is important to know that you know, your, your aquaculture gear and your product is private property and, and that it's, it's serious punishment if, if there is uh, theft or tampering with gear. So they can be in and around the lease, but they can't actually mess with any of your product. And you are allowed to have anti-theft uh, signage and stuff like that as well. So just some of the lease activities, basic rules that you're going to have to follow. Uh, you can only operate out on the leases from sunrise to sunset. Uh, just like wild harvesting. So because this area is uh, in a Gulf sturgeon critical habitat and Gulf sturgeon endangered species, the use of the bottom is actually prohibited for these leases. So you can't have oyster racks on the bottom or clam bags, for example. You're, you're going to be limited to suspended or floating gear only. So at the same time, there would be no dredges or mechanical harvest devices allowed because that's impacting the bottom as well. And then uh, an important one would be no platforms like a, or vessels, floating docks or anything like that can be out on the lease. So a vessel cannot be moored uh, in the area for more than 24 hours straight. No, no wild resources can ever be t uh, relayed to the lease. So you can't ever take wild oysters from the wild and move them onto the lease and then harvest them as farm product. Uh, any kind of working of the oysters like culling, sorting, cleaning, uh, all that needs to be done on the lease site. And then, uh, all, of course, uh, Kim's going to talk about the harvest requirements, things like that, but all of the products, or oysters that you harvest have to go to a certified shellfish processing facility. So direct to retail sales is not allowed. And at the same time, you would use your aquaculture certificate of registration card to harvest products, that, that card that Portia had on her slides, and an SPL or, or oyster license for Apalachicola wouldn't be allowed. But if you have a lease, you're going to have that AQ card. So resubmergence is a pretty important consideration as well. And this is about uh, protecting the product from a food safety standpoint. So oysters larger than three quarters of an inch have to be removed from the water that are taken out of the water for more than four hours from April to October, so the hot time of the year, that you have to resubmerge those for 14 days before they can be harvested again. And it's important to know that that includes flipping cages and de drying out the cages. So if you flip them out to reduce biofouling or something like that, for a day, they're going to have to be resubmerged for two weeks before they can be harvested. And that just prevents Vibrio from growing too much in the summer months. And you, you, ha you do have to maintain a replant or a resubmergence log for those oysters. And that's just basic information. What oysters were they? They need to be separated from the rest of the product. 
where did they go, which lease they're on, and things like that. So they can be, we can keep track of that information. So for allowable gear types, there's really three basic types that uh, the industry uses. Uh, up here on the top left, that's a floating bag, as opposed to down here on the bottom right is a floating cage. And those operate very similarly, um, but basically the floating cage is a lot larger. And then the other type is this suspended long line system. So there's a lot more infrastructure involved in that. So uh, Bill Walton's gonna get up later. He's gonna talk a lot more about the gear types and advantages and disadvantages to which gear type you wanna choose for your farm. But um, just, just know that these are probably the most common and you, and you can't use anything that's gonna go on the bottom. So these are all suspended or floating gear options. So for the gear itself, it, it definitely has to be securely anchored. You don't want it get, getting away off your lease or anything like that. And it, if you're gonna do any kind of mechanical cleaning to the cages or things like that, like pressure washing, for example, that cannot be done on the lease. You're gonna to have to take it out on the land to do that. If you're cleaning things, and that includes lines, anchors, uh, cages themselves, that you can use hand tools only on, on the water. And during harvest, you have to uh, rinse and clean the gear out of, over, over the grow out area. And there's no pollutants or any kind of chemicals allowed to be put on the lease, tars, oils, greases, things like that that you may coat gear with. Uh, if you do want to do an anti-fouling coating or something like that, we have an approved list. You can contact us for vendors, but there are only a very short list of, of approved coatings that you can use that are, aren't going to do environmental harm. So, and, and you have to follow the product labeling or instructions for applying those. So we mentioned uh, in terms of gear marking, uh, this is an important part, all floating and suspended gear, you're gonna have to individually mark each cage or, or system. And you can see that's just basic information, your company name, your, your AQ number, of how to, how to get in contact with you. Those have to be, uh, you'll have to attach these to all the different floating structures and cages. And this, is, this really helps identify your product if it gets dislodged and lost in the environment. Um, I think a lot of the growers after Hurricane Michael over in McCullough County found it helpful that it was labeled so because a lot of gear got all mixed up together and they were able to sort it out better if it's actually identified. So it's a requirement that uh, is, is beneficial as well. So uh, in order to just kind of prevent any debris from escaping from the leases on, and getting out into the environment, all the leaseholders are responsible for collecting and just properly disposing of all your gear. If it becomes derelict, you, you have to take it in to land and, and dispose it in a landfill. So and especially if something gets dislodged from a storm event, severe weather, or, or you lose a line of cages or something like that, it's your responsibility to go get it and bring it back. And at the same time, if you ever decide to terminate your lease for any reason, you, you have to remove everything off of that lease within 60 days of termination. It's your responsibility to clean it up if you decide to not have the lease anymore. So that's all the, it's, I hope I left time. Do you have any questions about uh, lease operations? Yes, sir. Uh, well, I guess you were talking about we would have to pay to have it surveyed. How much is it to have it surveyed if we was approved for it? It, it does depend. What's our average cost? It, it's really variable. So. Yeah, probably fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars. It varies. Um, so it quadruples once it goes off land. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's pretty expensive. <laughs> yeah. It's not. Uh, there's not a lot of people that can do it. There's very few right. people. Uh, what we recommend is that all the leaseholders kind of work together because you'll get a lot cheaper of a cost if all 38 leaseholders have the same survey and it's easier to be a much more consistent survey because not only do we need the parcel surveys, but then we need an overall survey of the, the use zone too. They have to meet the minimum technical standards. But you're close enough to land that I think that you know, you'll know have you'll have benchmarks that they can build from. So, but it's still, Fifteen hundred about an average. So it costs us fifteen thousand dollars to have our lease survey. Plus or minus. And there's no grants, you know that. So no, there's no there's no grant money available to do that. We are trying to purchase the lanterns and the signs so that we can provide those to the surveyors, so the leaseholders don't have to bear that cost. Because uh, that's about what 150 bucks a sign, and probably about mm -hmm. the same for the lantern. And how many are there in the AT? Hopefully, 22, I think. Yeah, so so. That, that's a pretty significant cost. That's, oh, I'm sorry. If you end up with a corner marker, it's saving you about 500 bucks that we're going to be able to purchase those and provide them. A couple grand to just get 
the survey is definitely the, besides getting your gear itself. I mean, survey is a big cost. So, yeah. And the gear, instead of um, is there a grant for that to, to, to get all the gear? You got you got to pay for all that. Yeah, you have to pay for it. So. How many bags is on these? Well, I'll, I'll let uh, Bill Walton's going to get up and he'll talk a lot more about that. And we have an economics uh, at, the, at the very end. Our, uh, you, uh, from University of Florida Economist is here to kind of talk more about costs. So let's, let's, let's save those questions for a little later. So, okay. All right.